Hey guys, welcome back. It's Grandmaster Mac Molnar with another video here. And uh, in today's lesson, we're going to be talking about the Evans Gambit. Uh, the Evans Gambit is a nice counterpart opening to the Italian game. And um, this would go along really well if you're, if you're already playing the Italian game with either white or black. This, this, uh, this, op this opening uh, video here is going to have some benef benefit for you. And I have the, uh, the starting position of the Evans Gambit right here, so you could just see it immediately. Um, one one thing I'll say about the Evans Gambit quickly here is that uh, it's it's an opening that's been played actually by a lot of really high level players. So despite the fact that it's a gambit that isn't seen much in um, like elite modern tournaments or something like that, you know, it's still a perfectly viable and good opening. And uh, champions like Bobby Fischer used to play it regularly. Um, Bobby Fischer was a big fan of the Spanish, but when he played the Italian game, he I, as far as I could tell always played the Evans Gambit. And he, he had a, a very nice victory over Ruben Fine, which is a, a well-known game in this in this opening. He ma he managed actually to beat Ruben Fine, I think, in, in 17 moves. And uh, Ruben Fine was one of the best grandmasters in the world at some point. So, um, yeah, that, that says something good about the opening. Um, Paul Morphy used to love to play this opening. And even Gary Kasparov managed to win a nice game against uh, Anand in this, in this opening. So he, he was a... Uh, you know, he would play it with some frequency. Uh, so let's hop right into it here. Okay, so after this uh, the starting sequence, um, we'll actually go through the the first few moves here one more time. So it's e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, which is the key move of the Italian game, creates its uh, the the namesake of the opening here. It it pressures the f7 pawn, which is the weakest square in black's position, and um, tactics flow through that square very often in the, in the Italian game. And in the Evans Gambit, it's going to be even more so the case because white gets a lead in development. They're going to have more, um, you know, a attacking and aggressive options with their better placed pieces. So in the Evans Gambit, you're definitely going to be want wanting to pay attention to this pawn uh, if you're playing the white pieces. So black plays bishop c5, and this is where the Gambit gets its uh, key move and black has a couple options here they can retreat the bishop which is um, not not the most popular but it does get played and the other main option is just to take so this is what gets seen uh, by far the most often and from white's point of view here they're sacrificing this b pawn in order to get a better center and a few tempi for their pieces so they want to play c3 here, which builds up a bigger center. It gets a tempo on the bishop. And basically, you know, universally after whatever black plays here, white is going to be playing d4. And just building up this big center quickly. And after that, kind of deciding what to do with their pieces. Okay, so black has a few responses. They can go bishop a5, which is the classical move. They can go bishop c5, bishop d6, which is a more modern one. And even bishop e7. Um... Bishop b7 is actually a pretty underrated move. It's, it's definitely a good choice for black. Um, I, I've never seen anyone play bishop f8, but you know I guess that's in theory a move too. Um, definitely, of course, not bishop a3. I feel like at this point I might as well just mention every single bishop move. But yeah, bishop a3 is obviously not an option. So uh, let's start with bishop c5. This move is probably the most cooperative for white because it puts the bishop in harm's way on c5 where it's it's going to be walking straight into, into what white wants to do anyway. So this really isn't the best square for the piece. White can start with d4, just go ahead and play it. They have it. They have this square covered enough times. Three defenders, three attackers. <clears throat> so white's got it covered. Uh, if black takes, white can, white can recapture like this, but I'm gonna recommend a different variation here. White can, white can actually castle, which is pretty, pretty interesting. And we're gonna see right off the bat here that there's a tactic involving f7 if black goes ahead and captures this pawn. Um, so I mentioned it in, in the Italian game video, but one thing to always pay attention to is uh, loose pieces and the f7 pawn kind of combined. Um, so this bishop on c5 is loose, f7 is attacked and defended the same amount of times. If you threaten it again, you, you, can, you can make an, uh, a threat to win it or make some kind of threat against it. Uh, the best move here is actually bishop f7, but queen d5 is, is kind of like a tempting move, which 
which would apply the same type of thinking, attacking this um, this bishop here, threatening checkmate. But luckily for black, they have queen e7, which is going to defend everything and keep things um, keep things under control. Even after this, black is going to be able to play something like knight f6 and gain some time, castle quickly, which white is uh, not interested in letting happen. So white should play bishop f7 here, take this, uh, this pawn. After king f7, white plays queen d5, attacking the the king here attacking the bishop and picking up some some uh some material back um, one thing that's going to be a common theme in pretty much all of these evans gambit variations is that white is really not interested in um regaining their 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 material back in um kind of un unsatisfying ways so white has sacrificed material right off the bat they're looking to play a kind of a spirited gambit and um yeah just get some attacking chances so things like allowing exchanges and um heading towards an end game they're just you know there there are things that aren't interesting to white's not interested in doing so uh, i like this variation though one of the reasons why i kind of went went on that um little talk there is because considering that white is really angling for an attack and has this aggressive mentality in the uh the evans game but i think there's a couple of variations here which pop up which kind of um show this in, in a in a good way also the the uh, obstacle bishops here tend to favor the attacker because it's an extra piece that is not able to be neutralized from your opponent so it's it's like you get to attack with an extra piece here which they they don't have a counterpart to stop um anyway uh black often plays d6 here queen c3 and then something like queen f6 <clears throat> so this is where i I, uh, I made that talk about trading pieces exchanges and knowing what you're you're fighting for in this opening because after a move like this you might be faced with a decision to trade queens and basically that's the last resort you you want to exhaust all other options before considering trading trading queens in the evans gambit um, so white actually has a a good response here they can play e5 just shut down the option to trade queens and then if black takes back with either the knight or the or the pawn um, white's gonna have options like rookie one which put a ton of pressure on uh, the king here which can't castle anymore since it's already moved and yeah this this starts to fall apart for black because yeah they can't get their king out of the danger and all these center file files are open white's gonna have this bishop head, head towards some some dangerous squares and white has a great attack it's definitely much stronger than what they've sacrificed at this point. So I would say bishop c5 is not really a great option. Um, I know I, I was a little cooperative here at taking this uh, this pawn, but if if black just plays a regular move, white will take back with a big center and good uh, Evans Gambit style counter, uh, well, not counterplay, but uh, direct play, which we'll, we'll see in similar variations coming up. So bishop c5, I don't recommend. Um, bishop a5 is the normal move. Uh, this is a good move. And white plays d4 anyway. It's it's important that white plays d4 basically no matter what because in a lot of variations white wants to play queen b3 and this isn't the best option for for white if black can play knight h6 safely and then quickly castle afterwards. But now that d4 has been played, bishop h6 is always a response to to knight h6 just eliminating the defender and then all all queen b3 attacks now are are much more. Uh, much more dangerous so black can play this this position a couple ways here normally they'll take or they'll play pawn d6 not <laughs> d6 not dot d e6 okay so anyway yeah so let's see so let, we can start with e takes d4 and <clears throat> white has a couple of good moves they can castle or they could play queen b3 um personally i like queen b3 i think it's it's a little more exciting leads to positions that are less explored and black needs to come up with a way to defend this pawn immediately so they usually play queen e7 queen f6 is also a move and white will castle here and not not fearing that this pawn on on e4 is unguarded because of the pin that's going to pop up with the rook on the e-file plus um you know it's a it's a much more minor concern compared to the the rook the rook pin but this queen is also useful on e7 that it's it's guarding f7 here so you know the queen's not so interested in, in moving around at this point um and and white has good counter uh good play here i think 
because of the fact that uh, I have a bunch of other variations planned here, I'm going to not analyze this one in too much more detail, but you could definitely explore it and look at some games that were played in this line. I actually had this position against uh, John Bartholomew in a must-win game um, <clears throat> to get my second Grandmaster Norman. Luckily, I was I was able to, to win that game. So I, I, you know, I think that would be a fine game to, to look up in the database or something like that or some other ones that are kind of similar, but I, I can uh, vouch for this opening being, being credible at least. It's totally uh, something that I've used in my, my opening, uh, my games as well. So um, let's go back. So the move D6 is also uh, also an option here. And Queen B3 is a good response at this point. And, and Black needs a very accurate move here because this pawn on F7 is under attack, but it can't be defended nonchalantly here. If, if Black were to play a move like Queen F6 or Queen E7, these moves don't actually work out so well. And like I mentioned before, Knight H6 is also not a good option to defend the F7 pawn because we can always capture it. Um, so one tactical theme that's reoccurring in this line is that this Bishop on A5 can be a little bit loose here. It's, it, it can be exposed to checks on A4 or B5 from this, uh, this Queen once this Knight is out of the way. So White plays D5 here, knocks the Knight um, somewhere different and in this particular position black can play this this kind of crazy combative move knight d4 which is kind of unclear but um, you know I'll just kind of show it here anyway so something like this and then queen a4 check picking up the bishop and white should have the better game here definitely and if black were to play a move like queen f6 instead of queen e7 uh, the same tac tactic is going to work, but um, like this type of move leads to a lot less counterplay because white can simply pick up the bishop, and they're not going to worry about the queen taking here. So, yeah, th all these uh, these variations here work out nicely for white. So in this um, in this position here with queen b3, white uh, black needs to play queen d7, this very exact move, preventing any checks on um, a4 or b5. And this is this is still a complicated game. White has compensation, but yeah, it's about even, I'd say, and yeah, just a hard fight is ahead. Let's go back. So um, black can also play bishop e7 here. Um, one of the moves I mentioned at the start, this is a really good good defense. Um, white's going to play d4 like always, and black has to be careful not to play too passively here. Uh, the move d6 is already much kind of like... Uh, Kind of like a compromised version of the same defense we were just looking at. The bishop is much better on a5 than it is on e7 because the queen can't can't be developed at any in any way basically. So there's there's no support to be given to this pawn here basically. So white's happily going to play queen b3. Once again, we see that there's issues with this pawn here. Um, black doesn't have this knight h6 defense like always because you've played d4 and you can capture. So this is not um, not appealing for black. They must play knight a5 here. But this is going to lead to an advantage for white after these moves. Um, both of these pieces are hanging, but white's white's no longer down material. They've gotten their sacrifice pawn back. And uh, black's king is going to end up compromised once these pieces are traded off. So this is good for white. <clears throat> uh, let's go back. So after bishop b7, um, taking here also gives gives white a nice big center. This bishop's not on a very active square. So white white is slightly better here with their... Their nice pawn center, the ability to just develop their pieces completely freely at this point. Castle, knight c3, bring the bishop out wherever. And yeah, they have a nice a nice game here. So the best move is this very surprising knight a5. And I remember studying the Evans Gambit and just being shocked when I saw this the uh, the first time around. Thinking like, what 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 is this all about? But um, yeah, this is actually a very good defensive idea. And since, since black can't really maintain their control of the center they really just want to get this bishop off of the diagonal here. And depending on where the bishop goes, like if the bishop were to retreat, uh, usually black is just going to play d6 here and just give away the pawn back on e5. Um, this is, this is I think, the best, the best way to play for both sides here. But there's another uh, idea behind this, which is that if knight takes e5, black has a uh, kind, of, kind of counter shot against the center plan. They're going to take, take, and go d5 which attacks the knight, attacks the pawn, and once white trades, 
black doesn't yeah black doesn't really have any problems here for the most part so they you know they're well developed they're no longer facing any uncomfortable attacks for the most part and it's about even although even black might be slightly for preference here with the bishop pair and uh you know like on on uh hindered development so white usually kind of isn't interested in um regaining the material kind of with you know unsatisfactory positional compensation for that so um yeah white will play bishop d3 instead much more in the spirit of this gambit and black will usually play pawn d6 defending things white takes black captures back white takes and yeah this leads to an you know imbalanced position which is very interesting for both sides black has this queen side pawn majority uh white has the king side pawn majority and this extra e pawn in the center so white usually looks to do something like let's say castle here and then um some like queen c queen c2 is a pretty pretty good move and white's white's plan in in some order is going to be something like knight e knight f3 e5 you also have squares like knight d2 and bishop e2 of your pieces and or rook d1 <clears throat> so white's got a interesting play but black is also um doing fine here and it's an Im imbalanced game both sides have have their chances if they can make their trumps uh str turn out stronger than their opponents they they definitely have some chances to win the game here so pretty interesting uh definitely a good variation for both sides and there's also bishop d6 which is was once played against me by actually uh, at least a, a bunch of people but among among uh some of them or at least one of them would be uh robert gm robert hess i know he's uh pretty well known on chess.com these days but we we um we uh duked it out in this line once and it was a very interesting game uh but you know it, this is not not a uh completely un unexpected sideline you know good grandmasters will play it and it's it's possible for the players of any level will, will do it um <clears throat> Uh, white should play d4 and after knight f6 castle and personally i've never been that big a fan of this variation for black because it's awkward to have the bishop here guarding this pawn on e5 white's plan is relatively simple here they're going to do rook e1 they can uh, play bishop g5 if black doesn't play h6 at any point um, knight d2 is also a good follow-up and then usually this bishop gets retreated and the knight will come up to c4 attacking this kind of awkward awkward setup that black has and i think yeah it's it's a pretty pretty uh nice variation out of out of all the variations that white could face in the evans gambit this was always one i was hoping to see um <clears throat> okay so castle castle rookie one i think usually at this point black takes the time to play something like h6 here um and then uh knight d2 for example and Black usually tries to overprotect this pawn with something like rookie eight, and moves like uh, actually I think it's queen b three here, queen e seven something like this, and then White will oftentimes just retreat the bishop, play knight c four, and just continue to pressure this e five square, which is very awkwardly defended from Black, and you know another another battle battle ahead, so full 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 blooded game here. Uh, the last thing we're going to look at in the Evans Gambit is this um, <clears throat> this declining of the Gambit, and this is also a good uh, a good way of responding. Um, I played some some very good grandmasters in this line as well uh, from the white side. So people people who are maybe not so familiar with this line or just looking to decline and play a less um, tactical uh, struggle, you tend to play play this variation i think but you know from from um i guess one of my reasons for mentioning the uh the comment about the grandmass is just because even though it may not be popular to decline this gambit it's it's perfectly acceptable and a good way of playing also so white usually plays uh a4 here and i think this move is the best it threatens a5 which is gonna cause problems to the bishop black should play a6 this is the best move if they play a5 then it allows b5 which is kind of uncomfortable for black now this knight needs to get knocked around usually it heads into d4 here and white should be careful not to take this is going to allow double attacks like queen g5 on the knight and um, 
pawn here. But also this knight is loose and there's a lot of peace on this diagonal, so things like queen f6 could even be dangerous. It's something that white should be careful about. White should just be happy to just take this uh, this positional advantage they get. They get to play c3 and just shut down the bishop a bit. And I think this is, this is a nice position for white. Um, yeah, moves like bishop a3 are, are pleasant. That might be used in the future. There's castle and kind of keep this bishop locked out with, with a nice little space advantage and pressure on this pawn here. So black should play a6 going back a little bit. So they should play a6 here. And from white's point of view, the reason why they play a4 and then have this move a6 included is because it adds strength to this plan of playing knight c3 and then knight d5. So white will look to do knight c3 at a good moment later on, play knight d5 and attack this bishop, which is now going to be forced to be recaptured with this pawn on, on the c file. And this is a concession compared to black being able to take with the a pawn, which opens up their, their rook and keeps their pawn structure connected. So this is a, a nice little nuance here that white can try in order to create some, some problems. Um, so yeah, white might play knight c3 here and game could kind of develop in I think just kind of like a normal fashion here. Something like this would be a good example of how the game could continue. And white's not so so concerned with black, like let's say black taking like this and then capturing this pawn now because the the knight's gonna get trapped. So um, I'm not gonna go too much farther. I think this is a really good intro and Kind of just gives a, a good overview of all the lines. And maybe in future videos we'll talk about some of these specific variations a little bit more. Or uh, show some games that I played or some other grandmasters played in um, in this opening. But I completely encourage encourage um, either either side to play this opening. It's it's a really it's just a blast to play this opening. I, I guess uh, I'm I'm biased because I have a very active um, attacking kind of style. But I think I think all players will like these uh, these these leads in development that you can get these these quick attacks on the f7 pawn and um, it's been been chosen by other champions as well so you know you'll be in good company if you decide to play this opening um, like always um, please like and share this video if if you thought it was nice and helpful it helps us keep this content uh, coming along uh, also check out GrandmasterMac.com which has more videos like this and a full course on the Italian game so. Um, I'll catch you all next time. Take care.